All right, so the last topic for the introductory section on limits um, is this idea of a difference quotient. This is something that's going to come up again. We're going to revisit this once we get to this second chapter on derivatives. Um, and, and because this, this difference quotient that you see here, this is part of the definition of a derivative. We're going to see that coming up. Um, so the way this works is you're given a function and you're given some point in the domain of that function, right? Um, now, to be a bit more precise, we want to guarantee that, there, that the domain actually contains an interval, right, on either side of this number a. So, so we want an interval containing that point. Um, now, a is a number here, right? This h, though, this is some unknown quantity. h is now a variable. So what's really happened is, is from this original function, by choosing some point in the domain, you've actually defined an, a new function, right? So we could, maybe we'll call it d for difference, right? So like d, but it's a function of h, right? So this is important to realize that uh, the, the variable dependence in this thing is actually on this h, right? a is not a variable here. a is some fixed number. h is where we get our variability. Um, now, we want to think of this h. Um, we want to think small here, right? We want to think of some number that's close to 0. But again, it could be either positive or negative, which is why we want that, that open interval around this point, because we want to allow for values that are both a little bit bigger than a and a little bit smaller than a, and we want to make sure we stay inside the domain of our function. Um, so. These come up quite a bit in calculus, and we, we sort of mentioned in the introductory video, we mentioned the context in which these actually appear. These appear in, this, in the context of this problem where you have some information about, let's say, position. Uh, so maybe this is, and now I'm using x as my variable here, but maybe this is position as a function of time, right? Um, and, and so we can think of this h here. Think of this h as a time step. So there's some particular time at which you've, you've measured your position, right? h is some time that you allow to elapse before you measure your position again, right? So let's say 10 seconds later, one second later, half a second later, you measure your position again, right? And you're considering the difference in those two values, right, which is how far you've moved over that time period. So the distance traveled divided by the time step. This is exactly your average velocity, right? And what you're doing here is you're looking at this ratio, you're looking at this average velocity, and you're asking yourself, what happens as you calculate this increment, this abs average value, over smaller and smaller and smaller values of h? So as you shrink that time step down, um, what happens to the average? Is it approaching some value? If it does approach some value, then this is something that you could think of as your instantaneous speed, right? Instantaneous velocity. Um, so that, that's sort of where, where this idea of a difference quotient comes from. We're going to see in the next chapter that it can also be applied to graphs. Uh, this notion of a tangent line to a graph also fits this same context. Um, but since we haven't introduced that idea yet, for now, it's probably easiest to think in terms of of average versus instantaneous speed. Uh, so we'll look at a few examples to see how you set up these difference quotients, how they lead to limits, how you might evaluate them. Right? Um, and, and you can see that this is definitely going to be a scenario where if you want to if you want to ask what happens as h goes to zero, right? As h gets close to zero, you want to know what's going on. You'll notice that you definitely cannot just set h equal to zero, right? So notice that that um, d at 0 is, in fact, undefined, right? Because if I put h equal to 0, well, it's there in the denominator, right? Can't divide by 0. But of course, the numerator will be f of a minus f of a, also 0. So this is a 0 over 0 limit, right? So in some sense, every single derivative, once we get to talking about derivatives, is a 0 over 0 limit, right? So there's a reason why we want to get proficient in calculating limits that have this indeterminate 0 over 0 form. It's that they come up a lot, right? Every derivative, in fact, is a limit of this type. Um, so we'll look at a couple of examples, get the basic idea of what's going on, and later we'll develop techniques to actually evaluate these limits.